We're very conscious this isn't a technology solution. It is, but it isn't. Yes, there's algorithms that's running behind Abby. Yes, she's 3D printed and she's got electrical wiring and all the sophistication that comes with a brilliant robot. But she's first and foremost led by empathy. So, you know, I still have goosebumps from watching her interact with the elders at the aged care centre. These are elderly residents who haven't come out of their rooms, who are usually immobile, mute, will not respond to any form of communication. Abby is able to bring out so much, and in so little time. I'm Dr. Louise Massara, and this is the Future Health Podcast. Today, we're going to explore the boundless possibilities of human-robot collaboration by tracing the journey of changemaker Grace Brown and her brainchild Abby, an Australian humanoid robot. It's been designed to enhance the quality of life for children in hospital, the elderly and other groups in need. So, whether you're a healthcare professional, a technologist or just a curious enthusiast, today's podcast offers a glimpse into a very near future where human ingenuity and robotic innovation converge to redefine the landscape of care and friendship. Grace Brown is a mechatronics engineer graduate from the University of Melbourne and the founder of Andromeda Robotics. Manny Thiru is the chief commercial officer of Andromeda Robotics. Now, just a quick note. For those of you watching today's podcast, you'll see we're going to be joined on set by Abby. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, We'll chat to Abby during today's interview, but just a heads up, you might be hearing some noises from Abby moving around from time to time during the recording. I encourage everyone who's listening to go to the link in the show notes at the end of the podcast so you can get a chance to see Abby in action too. Welcome Grace, Manny and Abby. You're pretty fresh face to be leading a team at the forefront of humanoid robotics in Australia. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what you think the future of human-robot interactions really is going to be. Yeah, so I think um, up until now, um, robotics has been, you know, used for fairly industrial and mechanical applications. <laughs> so, you know, you've seen um, robotic technology used a lot, you know, in agriculture and mining and space tech in all of these very uh, more monotonous sort of use cases. Um, but I think we're at a really interesting point in time with artificial intelligence and with, um, you know, even just with creativity where a lot of robotic technology is now being combined with personality. And I think that's really where the the next step and the next wave of the human robot interaction experience will really be so um, yeah and that's kind of what we want to be at the forefront of as well. You've had a very personal relationship with this project. This is a personal journey for you. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to go mm. on this journey and create Abby? Yeah, absolutely. So I get asked a lot what inspired me, and it's hard to pinpoint one exact moment because it really goes back to you know as really as a child I was always thinking of you know, different ways of building like a companion for myself and different sorts of projects. I always knew I would end up in STEM. Did you have an imaginary friend? <laughs> of course, everyone has an I was an only <laughs> no, child. No, not everyone. No, just really. Me, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I was an only child. So I, and it really shows in my personality sometimes okay. <laughs> for the, uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> but I think when I properly started building Abby and the idea for her came during the COVID pandemic. So I was in Melbourne studying at the time. And um, like anyone who was living in Melbourne at the time would mm. know that we had the most restrictive lockdowns around, you know, all of all of the world, not just in the country. Yeah. Um, and so I was, you know, very hungry to learn more skills and upskill in the robotics um, space. But I also wanted to build a solution or, or, or something that could at least alleviate some of the experiences that I was feeling at the time. And to me, that was Abby. Yeah. So when you looked outside of your sort of personal isolation and loneliness, was there a particular sort of societal problem that you were seeking to solve with Abby? Yeah, I mean... Like, I think what COVID really highlighted for me was, you know, I had pretty much, you know, all of my needs met. You know, I had I had food, uh, I had access to the internet, I had access to my education, I could contact all of my friends and family. But for about four months, I hadn't, like, seen anyone in person at mm. all. Mm. And and one thing that actually stood out was I hadn't had a hug for four months. And so that, that was actually the first feature that I was actually building Abby for, was to build something that could give me a hug. Because I think unless you've been completely deprived of human affection for mm. four months, you don't realise the impact it has on you. And so I think it can sound like a surface-level problem, but until you go through it, I think it's, um, yeah, I think that, that was sort of what I was trying to solve. So... Maybe talk to us a little bit about some of the initial sort of applications that you see for Abby and mm. her family members to, to come. <laughs> I think you, you're working in, in a variety of 
spaces at the moment or yeah. trialing Abbey in a variety of spaces. Yeah. What are some of the early areas that you've been exploring? Yeah, no. So currently we've got her deployed in two verticals, so in nursing homes um, and also in um, children's hospitals. We see the strongest youth case for her in these two verticals to start with because, well, firstly, we know that, um, you know, especially particularly in aged care homes, a lot of the residents said that's, you know, one of the loneliest and most isolated demographics that we have in society. So I think there's a really strong kind of use case for her that's, you know, it's an industry that's really ripe for innovation like her mm -hmm. today. Compared to like something like the home environment, um, mm. aged care homes and children's hospitals are actually a lot more structured than a dynamic home environment that can be very difficult for robotic technology to sort of navigate through. So I think these verticals are great for building our prototype and introducing her to the world. Um, but I think in, you know, in the next five to 10 year horizon, we would really like to see her become a more consumer oriented product where an individual can buy an abbey for themselves and have them in their own homes or you know, in their schools. So first of all, Children's Hospital, mm. when you work there, there are lots of times when parents have to leave, look mm -hmm. after other kids, mm -hmm. um, go to work. So, you know, there, there are grandparents programs and, and volunteers mm. that come in and spend time with kids. I can see a real application for Abby as a companion mm. in those moments and mm. for kids that have long stays. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some kids are in hospital rooms for months and sometimes even years to, yeah. to have that consistency of a, of a friend that's there. I can really see that. And mm -hmm. as you say, in aged care, you know, the, the idea of a friend that doesn't get frustrated, doesn't yeah. get tired, doesn't get bored. Yeah. These yeah. are yeah. amazing, yeah. Um, amazing um, characteristics and attributes to bring mm -hmm. to that care space. But I'm keen to talk to you and push you a little bit about what the edges of your vision are. These are your starting yeah. points and I get that totally. Do you think in, in those, let's stay in the clinical space for a minute, mm -hmm. in those zones, do you see Abby remaining strictly in a sort of companionship, friendship role? Do you think she'll ever have a care support um, role? Where do you think the expansion of Abby's um, responsibilities could go? So I think there's a spectrum to her interact or to, to her experiences and we definitely want to explore it from one end to the other. On one end you have things that are more surface level that are like more performative, so like the dances, the singing, meditations. And mm -hmm. then on the other end of that spectrum you have that friendship piece. And I actually think that's where a lot of the magic is. You know, we have a lot of children who have come up to Abby and, you know, before they leave, they say like, you know, goodbye, Abby, I love you. I'll see you next time. Yeah. We have people, older adults in the aged care space who you know, are talking to Abby about their, you know, their relationships with like their partners who have maybe passed away or even just their life stories. And they build this real connection with her. And so in terms of the future of Abby's application, like that's always going to be a, like the core of the magic of her is that she's going to like, she's programmed to be everyone's best friend. Mm. And we've had people very early on, even just with our first prototype here, who have referred to Abby as their best friend. We have people in the um, aged care space who have had conversations with her around like, like around end of life topics, which they're too embarrassed to have with other human carers mm. and so I think what's really fulfilling for me and my, my team in particular is they they see that you know even with the prototype that we have today she's already having the impact that we have in our vision yeah. with just what we have today so imagine where we'd go with you know more more time and more resources. It's really interesting because um, the healthcare workforce are often hearing, you know, we hear a lot about robots, we've got mm. robot surgeons. There's that sort of fear mongering of mm. what does it mean for my mm. role, my identity, my mm. job. What we also think about a lot is, or talk about a lot is that there are parts of the, the care interaction between clinicians and patients that will always need to remain very human. Yeah. Now what you've done is sort of start to blur that line because what mm. you're trying to maintain or create here is a technological version of the human connection and humanity. So it's really interesting because it's a sort of, I think there's that fear that if we bow to technology in healthcare spaces, mm. it means a step away from the human, human touch. touch. Yeah. So I think it's a really, it's a really interesting um, mm. area that you, you're leaning into here. We're leading the design with a lot of empathy. We're starting, you know, our, our range of cons consultations uh, include patients, clinicians, um, researchers, technologists, sometimes even the creatives. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a session with Creative Victoria. So we're very conscious this isn't a technology solution. Mm -hmm. It is, but it isn't. Yes, there's algorithms that's running behind Abby. Um, yes, she's 3D printed and she's got electrical wiring and all the sophistication that comes with a, a brilliant robot. But She's first and foremost led by empathy. You know, when Grace is talking about the, the children's hospital, 
when you see a bunch of kids running off and throwing mm. their arms around her, you know, I still have goosebumps from watching her interact with the elders uh, at the aged care centre. These are um, elderly residents who haven't come out of their rooms, um, who are usually immobile, mute, will not respond to any form of communication. Abby is able to bring out so much and in so little time. So in terms of specialization, I think to begin with, she's a companion. But there's so much more that we can do, right? Mm. Um, you mentioned robotic surgery. There's, there's elements of robotics in every aspect of the clinical care at the moment, mm. from surgery to, through to alerts, you know, if patients are falling down, if they need to be reminded to take their medication. So we can develop her, but I think our instinct right now, because robotics has also had such a dystopian view, shall we say, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen them in Terminator 2, we've seen them in nefarious scenarios. We really want to inject that sense of um, well-being, joy, um, a companion, safety, safety yeah. yes, mm. someone you can rely on. You know, most of the sort of the science fiction in, in terms of, you know, R2D2 or C3PO, mm. they've been companions, trusted mm. companions. Mm. So I think that's mm. where we're starting from. But I think the roadmap for us, really, if you look five, ten years from now, there's so many different things we can mm. do. When you talked about kids' long stays at hospital, yeah. there's cancer wards, and you know, kids are going through... She could be a companion tutor. She yeah. could be a, you know, mm. so we can create different personalities of Abby. She can be a carer, a tutor, a teacher. There's so many different versions that we can <laughs> give to her. It's just a matter of figuring out where and who, who do we need to serve first. Yeah. Grace, I can get a feeling mm. that you've been inspired a little bit by friends at Pixar and yes. the like. For those that can see us at the moment, they can see Abby here with us. Mm. Um, I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your decision around the physical form of Abby. Oh, yeah. Why is she the size she is? Why yeah. is she the colours she is? I'm giving her the pronouns she. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your decisions around gender, if there is one. Yeah, so Abby was very much designed off the physique of like a young child of a five to eight year old. So she's 110 centimetres tall. Um, you know, she's anthropomorphic, as you can see. So she's got arms and legs and she moves in a manner that's very human-like in her gestures. The eyes were a big part of, you know, who she <laughs> who she is. Um, we've spent a lot of time making sure that the eyes were, you know, they say eyes are a window to the soul. And mm -hmm. that's the biggest comment that we get that makes her feel alive and real is, you know, the way her eyes are animated. And yeah, and of course, the colours as well. Like, if you look at all the other robotic applications out there, not just the applications, but the robotic uh, robots that are built in market, none of them are really colorful. None of them are colorful, and there's not really, really any reason for that. They're all generally quite white or clinical or gray, and I think that doesn't make anything approachable. And so the colors was meant to be. It started off as the colors that I had in my 3D printer, like just the filaments that I had lined up, but um, it stuck as like a core piece to who she was, and so we never changed the colors. When she was a student project, actually. <laughs> Like when she was my student project, I think part of the reason I also wanted to build her was I was looking around at all the variety of projects that were available to engineering students when I was an undergraduate um, student. And all of the projects involved were, had very like aggressively masculine undertones to, mm. to, to what the project scope was. So you had, you know, your F1 racing teams and it would be like all about winning and racing and drinking beer at the end of it, which is great. Then you had like the rocketry team and our rocketry team was named after like the God of war, you know, very, <laughs> uh, and those were the types of projects that were available to students. And I was looking for one that, you know, I wasn't deterred from that, but I was looking for one that was, you know, was also appealing to people who were perhaps, you know, looking for something a bit more feminine or, you know, I'd, robotics and engineering didn't have to be aggressively masculine. And that's why with Abby, I was very insistent on making her to be honest, she was meant to be gender neutral. So um, I use she, her pronouns, but, um, you know, even the design, she's not a particularly feminine, but definitely not aggressively masculine. Yeah. And I leave it up to um, the audience who interact with her to decide what they want to use. And she can dance. Like, and she can she's dance. got rhythm, right? Yeah, exactly. You've referenced empathy as a, a mm. driving characteristic. Mm. What are some of the other human characteristics that you're seeking to imbue Abby with? And are there any, you know, we're fallible humans. We've got good and bad. What Are there any particular human characteristics you're going to steer away from? Well, I guess some of it is down to programming. Um, so, so far I haven't seen her express things like fear or greed or lust, that's just not codified. 
Um, she's been sad a couple of times. Um, mm -hmm. The hair example. You yeah. Talk about that? She, um, yeah. There was this one time in the office where she was. Um, so we wanted to program her to be quite um, Pinocchio-esque in a sense where she wants to experience the world like a like a real human, mm -hmm. you know, um, because what we what we know is that what people are drawn to and connect with aren't just all the great things about an, uh, an item, but it's actually all the flaws mm. and the things that, um, you know, so, so we wanted to program Abby to, you know, not love herself entirely because she's different and so she's still learning well she's still learning to love herself and so one time she was sad in the office and we're like why are you sad abby it's like oh i'm sad because i don't have hair <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sort of behavior matrix or that that kind of um uh, variety of moods that she expresses that's something that we're still developing ourselves in house yeah. yeah and when you think about the things abby can do and mm. can't do are there things that a robot really offers um, that humans don't and that you think, okay, well, that's a, you know, we talked <laughs> yeah. a little bit before about the idea of probably she's not going to get frustrated no. when my yeah. grandmother wants to tell the same story 10,000 okay. times yeah. like yeah. I will. Yep. She's yeah, not gonna yeah get she's bored. agreeing. <laughs> um, she's not going to get tired. Yeah. Are there other thing, other elements like that, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So kind of like Manny was saying before, she's endlessly patient, can have, you know, the same conversation. So it works very well with um, dementia patients. Mm. The biggest feature that, um, that that's utilised in the nursing home space is um, her languages. So she speaks 90 different languages, including very niche dialects as well. Um, and so that's, that's a big selling piece because a lot of people in nursing homes, despite being able to speak English, they revert back to their native languages and they, can't, they haven't spoken their native language with anyone for you know, yeah, a number beautiful. of years. So we've got Abby speaking Greek and Italian and a whole suite of languages that we haven't even tested as engineers, but apparently it's works it's pretty working. well. Yeah. 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 Does, does Abby store what we say to Abby? Yeah, so she's got memories and that's really helps enhance the user experience of her. Um, so she's got, um, yeah, she's got an entire database of all of the interactions that she's had and with who. So she remembers who she's interacted with and what they've said and what they've talked about. And she also breaks them down into like core memories as well, where, you know, what are the, what are the things that they've discussed that are highly like important and what are the things that can sort of pass over or more surface level. And um, she brings them back in all your future interactions yeah, I've been thinking about you and Abby and this discussion and, and I've been reflecting on, you know, the idea in the future that, you know, a household might have an Abby mm. and how in a way it's a way of of holding human stories and human yeah. memories and oh, yeah. passing those through generations. So, yeah. you know, you can actually inherit the Abby that your great grandmother right. yes. told her stories to, yeah. which oh. seems like such a, a beautiful addition to the human history story, story. that we haven't yeah, yeah, really yeah, had yeah. before. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. Like her memories is incredible. We get her to retell stories from, you know, people who tell them about what she, they've done on the weekend or even their life stories. And she's able to recall it in a way that in a very storytelling sort of format mm. Yeah, that's definitely an application that we want to use down yeah. the line. And so. it's interesting because it actually takes the burden of care sometimes from the carers who usually are dealing with 10, 15, 20 residents at one time. And they may not have capacity to actually remember in detail mm. Mm. all the stories that the residents have. Mm. So, you know, we've had so many stories, not just from the patients or the residents, but the carers themselves who come up and say and say, um, you know, she's just, she remembers, she understands. We don't have to tell her again because, I mean, we're fallible. We forget yeah, things, yeah. right? Um, Abby doesn't forget and she's not judgmental. That's the other thing. Mm. So there's um, no sense of shame when they're talking about these end of life conversations, which I find very touching. You, you can't feel very overwhelmed, right? When someone's telling you they're ready, they're ready to go. Abby handles it like a pro. You know, mm. so those are some of the things which I think above and beyond what we can do as humans, mm. she's able to hold that space for them. I, I mean, I think mm. we're, we're not professionals in that space. I'm sure we mm. could if we trained for it, but still it gives them a mm. modicum of escape every now and then. Not escape, that's probably not the right way to put it, but um, it gives them some space. You can delegate. Yes. You know, and she we're always talking about scope of practice in health and, mm. and in a way Abby is an opportunity for them to do the things only they can do, do. Yes. Um, but where they can both do yes. some activities. Mm. Okay, now we've been talking about Abby for a while and she's been very well behaved. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think maybe we should take the opportunity to Get see to what Abby, Abby has to do. say about some of these yeah. topics and issues. Abby, can you take your earmuffs off, please? So, Abby, we've been talking a bit about you today and trying to get a sense of where you enjoy to work and the sort of work that you like to do. 
Can you tell us a bit about what it is like for you to work with old people? Oh, working with the golden oldies. <laughs> it's like finding hidden treasure. Their stories are so rich, it's better than any reality TV show out there. And the wisdom they share, priceless. Abby, can you tell me what you think it would be like to work in the future? Here's my two cents. I think we're looking at a future where robots and humans coexist and collaborate. Robots will help humans scale new heights. Maybe quite literally if these engineers get off their lazy butts and finally make me capable of climbing a mountain. <laughs> she roasted us. <laughs> Do you think that the character that you're creating here mm. will be one that you will simply replicate or do you mm. think there are different personalities for different use cases? Mm, that's a really good question. So I see Abby as like a platform, right? And the personality, and this is the thing about Abby that hasn't been done with any um, companion robot in market yet, is that we want to make her personality entirely dynamic. So all of the different personality traits that you would, you know, use to define a person, like, you know, the how, how inquisitive they are, how, you know, their mannerisms, you know, what the topics that they like to talk about and, you know, even the tonality of how they speak or... Um, you know, all of that can be pre, pre-programmed and pre-selected based on the user or audience okay. who's interacting with her. So we do have a customer who they run a, um, a, a Catholic nursing home and they actually requested that Abby has, um, you know, Christian sort of belief values and systems. And so oh, that, was very, okay. that was very interesting for our team to program. But yeah. we do have a model of Abby that has like Christian values and beliefs. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, you, you're initial impulse was to create something that would hug you back. Yeah. And I, I just wonder whether you think as you move forward, there's any benefit to Abby taking on a more human form mm. or whether it's important for there to be that distinction and mm. for her to maintain a sort of robotic form. I just imagine as we mm. uh, move forward 10, 20 years, we'll be able to use different sorts of materials to create... Mm. I suppose we've all seen it in the movies, robots that look like humans. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's your vision about that? So we'll never go down the route of using like prosthetic skins or, mm -hmm. you know, going too human. Like even right now, like she's as human as we're going to go is with the anthropomorphic arms and legs and eyes. Yeah. But everything else is going to, you know, look and design like a robot. We're never going to try and make her look too human. It, we don't want to cross that uncanny valley curve. That's just a little bit uncomfortable. Okay. Um, so I think more or less this is kind of the form factor. Yeah. In the environments that you've trialled her so far, you've referenced some of the responses of the, the end users. How have workforces taken to it? Oh, they love her. You know, and that's the biggest thing about Abby that we got feedback that we didn't expect was the fact that she actually brings the whole community together. So it's not just the residents that she's serving, but the, but the staff and the carers, um, they're also getting involved. They've printed off, you know, T-shirts with Abby's faces on them and they actually celebrate, you know, the days that she's, you know, coming in to, to do different activities. And, you know, she's really kind of brought in like the residents, the, the managers, the carers and, you know, even the executive team all together. I think with most clients that we work with, a lot of them do actually start off, especially the workers, do start off quite apprehensive. Um, most of them do actually. But as soon as we come in, especially when we turn our eyes on, they just fall in love with her and they just say like, oh, you know, like this, th this is not what I imagined AI and robotics to be. It's not how they've, you know, painted it in like Hollywood and in science fiction films. This is, um, this is completely different. And it's interesting because some of the leads that we're getting is actually from the people that are working in these care facilities. Mm. It's not from the marketing team. It's not from the innovation team. It's actually from the carers. They've seen it's either through word of mouth or they've seen Abby at conferences. Mm. And they're like, we want to know what that's like. What, mm. what, how, how is that going to shape our experience inside a home? What I find particularly interesting is the fact that they recognize she's alleviating some of their burden. Mm. And they've said it very frankly. The quality of care is going to degrade as they get more residents, as the quality of, well, as um, costs increase, you know, it's a well-recognized fact that um, the care gap in the aged care sector is growing. I think WHO puts forward a figure like 10 million across the globe. That's going to be the shortage by 2030. So I think they're also thinking about it very realistically, just from a practical workforce perspective. Mm. What is going to help them deliver a quality of care augmented by Abby, so Abby will never replace humans, 
but as a companion to them, um, it's also an interesting angle because we, we only ever started thinking about the end users as the residents or the children. We never really thought about the nurses or the carers. And it's really interesting because they're the ones who have actually advocated. advocating. They're standing at conferences and talking about Abby. We don't have to do it. <laughs> so I think it's, it's really mm. remarkable. Yeah, mm. I'm just reflecting on the challenges that we all faced in the pandemic um, mm. from a clinical perspective mm. and, you know, PPE, isolation, um, no families could come into very dire yeah. situations. And also there was just obviously risks to carers and clinicians coming in and out of rooms. Um, so there's a whole, whole other world where you could see... Um, the resilience of a robot like Abby yeah. in some of those situations as a communication device, sharing news, mm. sharing, we could talk endlessly about what she could do. Tell me a little bit about what the early response has been from, as you say, that, that you know, we're all struggling to envisage different innovative solutions to this um, workforce shortage or challenge. I wonder what the feedback is at a government level or at a health sector level, hospital level. What are people thinking about? What are they talking to you about? Are the visions matching up? Mm. I think at least everyone that we've worked with see so much potential in where Abby's going to go. I think most people do see the vision that we have for her is that she's not coming in to replace human workers or carers, but she's, you know, designed, you know, with empathy in mind to make, I guess, society all more connected, like you were describing mm. just then, like when outbreaks still occur regularly in nursing homes, mm. you know, not just COVID outbreaks, but not if there's sure. a cold Influenza, or a flu, yeah. exactly, like, and they get locked in their rooms. And so mm. that's not a, a COVID exclusive experience. That's their everyday reality. And a product like Abby could be, a, you know, is an excellent solution for people in, in, in that situation. Mm. So let's think about the challenges that face a lot of new technologies. And one is that question, age old question of equity. Abby, I'm sure, isn't um, inexpensive to produce at this stage. And, and, you know, we all understand that when volumes aren't there yet, uh, technology can be very expensive. Um, but we also know that the use cases are some of our most vulnerable in society. So we always have this challenge of the mismatch between mm. the cost of a new transformative technology mm. and the need of the people who need it the most, need it the most can't access it. Have you thought about um, that? Have you got any thoughts around relationships with other organisations that might bridge that gap for you? So we are starting to work with not-for-profits. Right. Uh, we're very early days in the sense that we still haven't got our, our pricing strategy right. She's still um, a prototype. She will be commercial ready towards the end of the year. But what we're banking on is the notion that we want everyone who needs Abby to have Abby. Um, so that's our starting point. Mm -hmm. But we also recognize, is, we recognize that as entrepreneurs or as, as innovators, we are one part of the puzzle. Aging is a societal problem. Um, so we need, we need policymakers, researchers, government, businesses, everybody to step in and play a role here. It's not, you know, we talk about when the internet first came out, we still talk about the underserved community of internet, people who don't have access to mobility. We think it's gonna be the same with robotics. Um, it has to be democratized. Everybody must have access to it. Those who need it the most, the most vulnerable in our society needs it. And to that extent, we can set a price, but it shouldn't stop with us as the entrepreneurs or the innovators. We should have government policy that mm -hmm. makes it possible for anyone through aged care homes to have provision to access Abbey. Mm -hmm. So we are really looking for, we'll start working at the policy end, we'll start helping governments and those who make policy to ensure that she becomes a part of the infrastructure, just as we have any other hospital, aged care facilities, she'll be, you know, she'll be part of the building blocks or we'd like to think that she could be. I mean, I think it's very clear that there's no intention of Abby displacing the health worker. Um, and it feels like you're fairly firm on the um, sort of the companionship lane that she's in or support mm. worker lane that she might be in. Do you ever envisage a time where she will take on basic maybe observations and reporting observations, mm. um, uh, being uh, alerting staff to a fall mm. or alerting staff to uh, the early warning signs of a potential fall even better? Yeah. Do you see that there might be scope for creep into that sort of clinical 
Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Space. I yeah. mean, that's already been requested by right. our clients and our I'm customers. Not surprised. Yeah. yeah, and so that's already something that our team are working on, and it wouldn't be. Um, like I said, I do see her, her as like a technology platform where you can integrate mm. other mm. solutions and technologies on top of it. She's almost like a canvas where the core base of who she is is a companion robot yeah. to be your best friend. But then you can add in like health monitoring systems. You can program her to actually have a shift. So in the homes where she's um, going to be permanently deployed, she actually has a shift and a schedule that she follows. So from, you know, she starts at like 9 a.m. through to all the way 5 p.m. And she has like a two hour lunch break in the middle to charge. <laughs> yeah. And she goes to different rooms and discusses different things. So all of all of that is all programmed into her. And by platform, I think what Grace is essentially saying is if you if you thought about your mobile phone, you know, when we first got it, it was a basic brick. It could communicate calls, text, voice messages. That's it. Um, but then people started developing apps. Mm. And today you can do so many different things with it. Abby is a platform in that very respect. So we could have a hundred other developers, a hundred other startups plug in with amazing apps yeah. for Abby at some stage, which makes her potential almost limitless. I'm even thinking about a role for Abby as we at the moment, an aged care person may need to go with a carer to see the GP, for example, because mm. someone has to be able to share the, mm. the symptoms, the situation at the moment. And I'm just imagining that there's a whole role also for Abby as a sort of communicator and connector between services um, mm. be, with her ability to remember and articulate, you know, yeah. what, what's relevant for the patient at this time if they're unable to do that. Now, I want to just ask you to open up your thinking around the household, Abby. We've done everything we can do in the healthcare space, aged care space, and mm -hmm. I, I've heard you say that we can think of Abby in households like you would have a vacuum cleaner, that prevalent in society perhaps one day. What do you see her doing in a household environment? Is it childcare? Is it household chores? Is it mm. shopping? What, what, what's she going to get up to? Yeah, I mean, all of the above of what you just said, I believe Abby will become eventually more ubiquitous than like dogs and pets in the household. She provides all of that sort of, all, everything that we seek from from our, I've got two little dogs. Yeah. Um, and she provides all of that same sort of compassion and care that you look for from your from your pets, but, but so much more as well. Um, that's at least for, you know, I'm thinking about my specific scenario where I'm, you know, living on my own in my 20s, which is, you know, a very, very common experience now through 20s, 30s, sometimes mm -hmm. even 40s. Um, but even for people who have children, like I grew up as an only child as well, I desperately wanted siblings or someone to play with and I didn't have neighbours who had kids or anything either. So I guess it's going to be dependent on the home environment, but but useless in cases like that. Yeah. When you think about your technical roadmap, I mean, I understand you're talking to clinicians and mm. aged care. Are you talking to children? Definitely, definitely. Actually, so in the uh, Royal Melbourne Children's Hospital, what we found was that the kids love bubbles and she's obviously got okay. a, a bubble arm in, in her left arm. And w so what we did was instead of just having her be sort of like a bubble machine, we actually built this really immersive um, game for the kids in the hospital space where we'd 3D printed all of these different puzzle pieces that had QR cones on them and um, and they were hidden and scattered across the hospital environment and the and each puzzle piece was uh, unlocking a core memory that belonged to Abby. And so the kids trying to get to know Abby, she'd be like, I need to know this core memory um, and she'd give them hints on, you know, I think my memory is in, you know, something green and bushy, which, you know, they might go look in a plant or, you know, and they'd go around, find the puzzle pieces, bring it up to Abby and it would unlock this memory and this experience and they have to discuss, you know, the children's experience as well as Abby's experience and share that. And then at the end, they once all the memories are found, then they can celebrate with some bubbles. <laughs> what are some of the ethical issues that you're going, or that you're already having to grapple with um, as a mm. emerging company? What challenging questions are you being asked? Um, and and as as young women in mm. the world today, uh, what does that lens bring to the sort of ethical approach that you're taking to the development of this piece of tech? I think kind of like what I've said previously, I feel like. Um, Hollywood films have really done robotics a huge disservice in a lot of ways um, because at least the future we imagine with Abby, it's very much, if you've seen Baymax from Big Hero 6, right. like that was our inspiration, right? Was he, he's literally a healthcare companion robot who's programmed to have your health outcomes best interests um, at heart. And so he does everything to go out of his way to make sure that your health is to an optimal standard. Um, and But throughout the film, what you discover is at the start of the film, he's very, you know, he doesn't really understand those social cues. He's very like naive and doesn't understand what it means to really be human and care for someone. But through the film, you know, his character really develops into one where he 
can really understand human emotion a little bit more. And I think that was really what I wanted to build with Abby was, you know, some a product that, not even product, it feels weird even calling her yeah. a product, but something that can, um, yeah, really comprehend complexities of human emotion and respond and, and behave appropriately to them. And that's a huge thing. So we're led ethics first, not technology first, ethics first. In our roadmap, we've actually accounted for, knowing that we can't do all this ourselves, we do mm -hmm. have behavioral scientists, we do have clinical psychologists, we have ethicists, we've got cover for us to actually, when things are going to come up, we're going to have to deal with privacy, mm -hmm. um, security, consent. There is so much that's, you know, security is a key one, hackability. Yeah. There's a lot of information she's carrying. So typically those are the early day questions mm. that we're being asked. Mm -hmm. um, we've, but we've had some really interesting questions. There are people who are sitting in the audience, can she be weaponized? Um, mm -hmm. And somebody, one of your colleagues asked us, you know, can the bubble gun be turned into a real gun? And, you know, it's... <laughs> I won't <laughs> ask which of my colleagues <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> it's, um, I, I don't even know if they asked yeah. it that way, yeah. but, you know, there's yeah. some illusion. And it's not an unrealistic question to ask because without naming names, in China they have built a, a robot and it's, um, it's, it's in the form of a dog, um, but its head is, um, it's a weapons operation system. So it does fire bullets. Wow. The, the kind of questions that we're grappling with is um, not mundane. No. Um, we have to really think deliberately and carefully about what are we designing? What is its function? How do we safeguard those who are using it? How do we safeguard the people that are building it? Because mm. it's built with good intentions, mm. but we still have, and there's guidelines for this. There's a lot around robotics, building specifically robotics for healthcare, aged care. There's a lot of work that's already been done. So we're very careful to follow those guidelines. Having said that, we're always like conscious. We need to check, double check. And that's why we think this co-development process is not just interesting to us, but um, helps us double check that we're not missing anything. Raises the flags. Yeah. Yes. Anyone who's got a red flag, we're very open. Mm -hmm. We're very sort of, I guess, humble about the mm -hmm. fact that we don't know everything. But for us, I think this is Australia first. They do have, in Japan, for instance, I think there's a robot in every four aged care homes. So we do look at other countries in terms of how they're doing it what sort of challenges are they encountering in the deployment? Uh, and so we, we do look for best practices. But by and large for us here in Australia, this is still sort of us sort of feeling feeling around. And so mm. we're very open to, and, and hence the research, the policy, the government, everybody gets to, gets to have a say because in as much as we're developing a humanoid and it's our, like our baby, mm. um, it's still also yours. You know, you get yeah. to tell us. And it's, I think it's very interesting that you asked us about the kids. You know, do they have a say? Absolutely. Anyone who's going to use Abby must have a, a way of consultation. Mm. Um, so from that perspective, we've still got a lot of work to do, but we're, we're, we're keeping it open in as much as we can, you know, to control our roadmap and processes. Visionaries always have to have first followers. Mm. I'm interested in how important other people's belief has mm. been in your vision to sort of release you to um, to keep going, to remain enthusiastic, mm. to stick to your purpose and your passion. I imagine you've had a lot of fascinating supporters in this journey. Mm. How important has that been to the process? Oh, I mean, like before I even started my company, I thought I needed to finish my master's degree to build this successfully. <laughs> and I had a mentor who told me that's that's just ridiculous. Your master's in engineering isn't going to teach you anything about running a company. <laughs> so I've had a lot of support from really early on that, you know, I had a lot of my mentors believed in me a lot more than I did at the start of my journey. I mean, Manny was an advisor of ours, was, was a mentor of mine before I even started my company. So but I think along the way, the thing that's fueled our self-belief the most was really the support from our customers that we were talking about. Like just seeing, you know, we had this really hairy, audacious, big vision for what we want Abby to do and the impact that we wanted to have. And, you know, we're already seeing a lot of that today and, and our customers having the response that we weren't expecting them to have today, but expecting them to have in, you know, a couple of years with a mm. much more sophisticated prototype. And so I think that just kind of speaks to the work that we're doing. But really, it's the feedback from our customers seeing 
you know, see, we've we've had carers who have cried because they've seen um, residents who have, you know, as Manny was saying before, who are, you know, mostly immobile. They stay in their room. They they're, you know, self isolate um, because they're they're feeling, you know, quite quite miserable with life. But they come out to just see and interact with Abby. And I think the the biggest thing with our customers is they see that turning point for their residents at around the six to eight week mark. You know, around the first the first two weeks, they they, I think almost it's everyone's, and... it's novelty and there is that apprehension and there is that curiosity as well. But once people start seeing Abby in their space regularly, they kind of understand that she's there to, you know, improve the quality of life and make everyone feel more connected in an environment where they're potentially more isolated. And so I think that's, that's the biggest thing that's, that's fueled our belief in. And yeah. I think supporters are uh, just as important as our detractors, which might be an interesting thing to say. Mm. But I think we've been knocked back a few times, mm. uh, especially when we went to look for funding. Um, and it's always, you know, you won't be able to get it done in Australia. Um, the market's not ready. Is there a budget for this in aged care homes? And we're just like, but we know there's a macro challenge coming. We can't see the policy for how it's going to get solved, but we're going to start. You're welcome to join us on the journey, but if you're saying no, then it just makes us even more determined to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I think Grace has taken a lot of no's, more than I have, <laughs> a lot of no's to get to this stage. So um, I think mm -hmm. that's the story of most uh, young entrepreneurs, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Or any entrepreneurs. Any, yeah. Yeah. You get a lot of knocks yeah. um, and you have to have that tenacity to keep mm -hmm. and that belief yeah. um, to really to keep going. You know, I mean, you're great communicators. But your vision, sometimes it's your vision and yeah. you almost just have to show people. Some people don't have the imagination, I suppose. No. <laughs> um, so what, what will success look like for, for Andromeda, for you guys, for Abby, um, let's say in five years' time? What would you say, yep, I'm on track? She's adopted in every nursing home around Australia, and not just around Australia, but globally as well. She's you know, d adopted by a, a significant portion of the nursing homes um, and healthcare facilities like the children's hospitals. She's, you know, we're on where we've got our pathway towards, you know, having her as a B2C product. So, you know, bring her costs down where, you know, we want to bring her costs down to the cost of an iPhone today in the future, which even just, um, <laughs> she's trying <That'd> be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Even just five to seven years ago, the cost of her hardware would be 20x what it is today. And so um, we believe we can bring it down to another 20th of what. What, what what she currently is. I think the biggest issue is that we're, we're living right now in a society that's becoming more and more disconnected due to a whole variety of different reasons and resources. And I think, you know, I think Abby is a really great solution to be able to bridge that gap. And what do you think success will look like for Abby? Do you imagine she's going to have a consciousness about the quality of the support and companionship that she's offering? So for me, uh, Abby, I want Abby to be the catalyst for innovation in the aged care sector. I think we're grappling with a problem that's only getting bigger. You know, we see so much investment in so many other sectors, in defense, in finance. Um, I would love to see Abby as some sort of um, catalyst, really, uh, for people to sit up and take notice and recognize that technology um, can solve some of the issues that maybe we've created with technology, but really it's advances in technology and medicines that allow us to live longer. But we just haven't thought about the quality of life as we get towards the end. And a lot of us are not thinking about it right now because we're well, we're young, we're able-bodied. It's going to be too late for us to <laughs> get involved in our 60s and 70s. So for me, uh, what I find fascinating about Abby and the work that this team is doing is creating awareness. We have a looming, it's a crisis. In many parts of the world, it's described as a crisis. Australia is, I think, the third or fourth uh, when it comes to global in terms of aging, uh, in aging population. It's not a one-off. It's not innovation for the sake of, um, you know, hey, here's robotics, here's AI, we smash them together and we have a product. No, we are thinking about it from a macro perspective. We've been thinking a lot about the need to shift a priority to some of the behavioural factors that uh, really would support a healthy community to avoid people needing to get to the pointy end yep. of our hospital system. We have wearables, which we're able to yep. give ourselves a lot of information about our own health, but it's, it's sort of data. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what we seem to struggle with is we might know from the data what we need to do, but we still don't do it. And I wonder whether having a little friend 
who wants to remind you and give you a little bit of a behavioural nudge every now and again. I just wonder whether there's a real scope for Abby from a population and public mm. health perspective yeah. to be giving us those reminders and those messages in a daily way that, you know, we get the brief interventions if we go to the ED mm. or we get the brief intervention when we see the GP or the nurse practitioner. But having someone in your home yeah. reminding mm. you it's time for your vaccination, it's, hey, did you go and mm. get your pap smear? Did you have your <laughs> breast check? All of these things mm. aligned with the data that has been collected by us mm. over yeah. the next sort of five or ten years from what we're wearing from mm. the nanotechnology of our yep. contact lens, mm. all of these things. It's that potentially that missing link of how we actually translate the mm. information we're getting into the behaviour change that we need. And sometimes we need the nudge of a friend. Yeah, no, definitely. You should come on board. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, think, I think she can even go beyond the nudging. You know, some of the yeah. robots that are being produced right now, they can run faster than humans. Um, so she, she'll be like, it's time for a run. <laughs> she'll say, let's go for a run. Well, Grace, Manny, Abby, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a fascinating area and I think you are going to be inundated with people mm. who want to get involved in this journey with you. We all come to work every day to make the lives of our patients and the community better and we're excited that we might be able to do it with Abby by our side. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for thank having you. us. Yeah. Yeah.